It's live. Okay. Hi, folks. We are back again to continue our series of talks. Uh, for those who are following us, we have been working on migration, social transformation, and globalization. And today we are doing something different. Instead of working, or instead of discussing on Irish literatures and films uh, in Paul's Celtic Tiger, today we are going to talk directly on the reflection of migration uh, on a life of an Irishman. So we are going to listen to Mr. Declan Peary, Deputy Head of Mission of the Embassy of Ireland in Brazil. And uh, when he's telling us his experiences living Ireland, out of Ireland, and in Ireland. Uh, we believe this, his experiences are going to be very relevant uh, for our background knowledge. Uh, this explains the subtitle of today's chat, Reflections on a Nomadic Irishman. However, before talking to Mr. Declan here, I want to say a few words on migration. Problematize the complexity of migra migratory movements together with different contexts of migration and its different criteria. First of all, I have to consider that people in the globe are always on the move. Throughout history, migratory, migratory movements are marked by a multiplicity of experiences which demand interpretation. Movement of migration have happened for different reasons, to escape persecution, war, conflict, poverty, environmental disasters, pursue more job opportunities, among others. It's still, still growing in the interdependence on a global level, the constant revolution of technology, the drive to expand scientific knowledge on the one hand and great inequalities on the other are influential factors which help people to cross borders and create new forms of life as well as new forms of risk and danger by taking on a novel character. To deal with this issue, it seems necessary to define the term migration and its subcategories and typologies. Theoretical readings on the causes and consequences of migration is also important considering, considering it as a social phenomenon associated with globalization. For William Patterson, 1958, Sedentarism and nomadism are not a priori conditions of human nature, and mobility or immobility are social and cultural products in which human beings belong to. The National Geographic Society 2005 has categorized the phenomena in many types based on the on the mobility of people. We have internal migration, which are movements of people within a country. External mi migration, when people move to a new home in a different state, country, or continent. Emigration, leaving the home country to move to a different country. Immigration, moving into a new country. It also included the return migration and seasonal migration. 
we must not overlook that migration of any sort is never an easy option. Leaving home, family, and friends behind always come at a painful price. Even when you are privileged and move with the future in mind. Along with difficulties, migrants can also experience new relationships which may enable them to enrich the host countries with their professional skills, together with their social and cultural heritage. This is just a brief summary on migration. So my idea by summarizing this subject was to raise a few ideas for discussion. Now let's move to our guest speaker, who is Anais Migrant. As I said before, I believe his experiences will enrich our knowledge on the subject. Lara, my scholar, will be asking him some questions. So welcome, Mr. Declan. We are glad you have accepted our invitation to take part in our live talk. And welcome, Lara, who is going to interview Declan. OK, thank you. So hello, everyone. Thank you, Professor Noelia. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Lara. I'm a researcher at Dallas of Hima, And I study Irish rap music. Actually, I try to analyze intercultural aspects um, in these songs, because most of these rappers are immigrants. They have arrived in, in Ireland by their childhood. So um, they actually express their identity through the lyrics and through um, their music videos as well. And this is what I actually analyze. Um, hello, Declan. It's very nice to see you here. And uh, we have selected a few questions for us to discuss. After that, some of the viewers may also ask their own questions and we will be discussing them as well. For starters, would you talk a little bit about yourself and um, your journey to becoming a deputy head of mission in Brazil? Okay, well, good, af um, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, apologies for joining late, but I had some technical issues and I've now moved from my computer to my, my iPhone to uh, improvise uh, at the last minute. But thank you so much for this invitation. It's very kind of you. I'm delighted to join you today. And I'm, I'm keen to have as much a conversation as, as anything else. I don't want to be just uh, lecturing about my experiences, but uh, as much as possible, if we can have this as a, a, a sort of intercultural exchange between uh, me as an Irish person and uh, the, any Brazilian audience that we have. So anyway, my name is Declan Heary, and uh, I'm actually a recent... Uh, uh, I recently turned diplomat. Only in the last four years uh, did I join the Irish Foreign Affairs and uh, Department. Um, so it's kind of my second or maybe, yeah, second career in a way. Um, and what's interesting is it's something I always had an interest in. Uh, I've always been fascinated by other cultures. Uh, growing up in Ireland, I think maybe I was lucky to be in a family that we were just naturally curious about the world. And I like to read and I like to learn about other countries um before i you know before i ever officially left ireland i used to like traveling i used to uh, travel around europe i spent a summer in tanzania uh working on a development project there um and generally just like to to learn from other cultures but curiously when i was growing up in ireland there weren't many cultures to be seen in ireland apart from irish culture um it was very rare to see other people people with different different religion, different skin color, different beliefs. Um, so truly, I feel like I grew up in a very, you know, homogenous culture um, at the time. Um, now, of course, the age I was finishing school, it was, you know, the late 1990s. And that's when the so-called Celtic Tiger started taking off in Ireland, uh, the economic boom, as it's as it's known uh, by the Celtic Tiger. Um, so in many ways, I was very, very fortunate. I, I came of age at a time when the Irish economy suddenly started becoming uh, much more successful. I went to university. I had lots of opportunities. 
Um, and yet the interesting thing is I never fully felt um, somehow comfortable in my own country. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 was, I was very happy there, but I felt like leaving university around 2003, 2004, even though supposedly the, the Irish economy was amazing and everyone had work and I felt like I couldn't quite crack the, the job market the way I would like to. And I never felt quite like I, I fit it in, uh, which is a curious thing. Um, and uh, interestingly, in 2005, I had an opportunity to become a diplomat way back then. And I, I got through the first stages of the very difficult process and I got to the interview stage. And I just simply, I, I messed up the interview, quite frankly. Um, I was a lot younger, maybe a lot more innocent. Maybe my preparation wasn't the way it should be. Um, but I think in some ways, it was a, a blessing in disguise. It was like, I feel like I had more, I had more growing up to do before I became a, a diplomat. Um, and uh, around that time, I, I had previous experiences uh, with doing internships in Washington, DC, in America. So I had the opportunity to go, to go back to Washington and to work uh, in 2006. And so I ended up living for seven years in Washington, DC from 2006 until 2013. And this was really, for me, uh, an, an emigration. It was an Irish person emigrating to, to America, which is very common. Uh, it's very common for Irish people to emigrate to English-speaking yeah. countries like America, Australia, the United Kingdom, um, also to other countries, but, but more the English-speaking ones, I think, are the predominant ones. Mm -hmm. But the other thing which is interesting is I wasn't... In, I wasn't um, I wasn't necessarily emigrating because I had to. So my older brother, he, he would have been from a generation that really experienced economic uh, recessions in Ireland when there were truly no opportunities, no jobs. And people, there was an expression when I was growing up, right, when I was very young, you had two choices when you were, you know, leaving school. You had either the, the plane or the boat. So the boats would take you to the United Kingdom and the plane would take you to uh, America or Australia or some other country. By the time I was leaving university, it wasn't a, an economic necessity for me to go, but it was actually something I had more opportunity. It was a choice, and I also had a greater opportunity to do something in, in America than I had at the time in, in Ireland. Um, and so, you know, it's an interesting one where traditionally Irish immigration was driven by economic necessity, whereas mine was more by choice. And I think a lot of people who emigrated at that time did it more out of choice than because they, they had to. Um, so I ended up spending seven years in Washington working for the World Bank, uh, which was a great opportunity for me. Um, it's a, a huge global organization and I got some amazing experiences and the money was very good too. Um, <laughs> certainly that was nice. Um, and another interesting thing when I was there, I, I, I met a, a lovely Brazilian lady who, who later became my wife. And uh, that started my connection with, uh, with Brazil. Um, but yeah, we lived in, in America for, for seven years. We had two children there, um, Ana Luisa and Gabriela, and, uh, who are now 11 and 12. And um, around 2012, 2013, we were just starting to feel maybe less, maybe less at home in America. We felt like we were looking for a place that we could call home. Um, we suddenly realized maybe we wanted our children to grow up in a culture that we could identify more with, be it Brazil or Ireland. And so we, we more or less decided in a rush, OK, let's go. Let's just go to Ireland. <laughs> let's go to Ireland during a really bad recession, uh, right after an economic crash. Um, so in a way, I've been, I'm on this kind of counter, counter cyclical emigration uh, process. When things are good in Ireland, I leave. When things are bad, I come back. <laughs> so that's, that's how I see maybe the, the macro picture of, of my, my life. Um, so yeah, we arrived back in Ireland in 2013 and I was determined to try a new career. And I tried, I tried to do a course in accountancy, which I absolutely hated. Um, and then I had a chance to do a, a master's in economics, which is something I, I had studied earlier. 
So I completed a master's in economics while I was looking for job opportunities. And uh, sure enough, um, the Department of Foreign Affairs had finally started hiring people again after many years of, of not hiring anyone at all because of the economic uh, crisis. And so I had the opportunity to apply and I was, I was very fortunate to be selected in 2016 uh, where I entered the, the Irish Diplomatic Service. And so I spent a year in Dublin working for the United Nations team in Dublin in, the, in, our, in our ministry. And when it came the chance to do a posting, um, you, in our system, you're given the opportunity to put your preferences, you know, number one, number two, number three. And we put Brazil number one because we <laughs> felt, A, my wife is Brazilian, and B, this was a chance to expose our children not only to Irish culture, but now to Brazilian culture so that we can cover all the various uh, sides of our, um, of, our, of our marriage, of our family. Um, and yeah, I've been here for three years now, uh, living in Brasilia. Um, and uh, I have one more year to go. And uh, from there, who knows? I know I'll be leaving Brazil next year, but uh, whether it's to go to Ireland or to Europe, I don't know. But uh, so in a way, you know, as a diplomat, I've basically signed up to a career of migration. That's what you do. <laughs> you constantly move and you constantly adapt and you constantly change job. And for me, that's something very exciting because um, uh, I think I get bored if I try to stay in one, one area too long. Um, and curiously, when I, was, when I was in Ireland in between America and Brazil, I also had started doing a, a PhD in economics. And I realized that PhD is not for me. Um, I think it requires a huge amount of discipline and patience and focus. And so I very much admire uh, the people who work in your university who can pursue very detailed uh, research in, in various topics, including, I'm sure, Lara and, and Oelia. And so uh, I, you have my respect for that. I, I don't think I could ever spend four years focused on, on one thing. I think I need to jump all the time. And so I think that's why why diplomacy is probably um, probably a good thing for me. Um, but yeah, so I'm on this path now where it's a constant uh, migration through my work. Whereas I think in my in my time in America, that was more around you know emigrating, truly speaking, and returning to my country as a returned immigrant, uh, return migrant. Uh, so it's a different type of experience, I think. So that's the quick uh, summary of my my last uh, I don't know 14 15 years or maybe more um, actually over the last 14 years I've spent 10 years outside of Ireland and only four years in Ireland so that too I think affects my my view of my own country you know in some ways I'm, I'm viewing my country based on what I read in the newspapers and what I see on Twitter and what I experience when I'm on holidays, which isn't real. <laughs> uh, so, so that's, that's, that's kind of the main uh, headlines for me. Um, I guess there was one, there was one thing I raised as well, which maybe we can talk about a bit, a bit about later um, in relation to my, my children, uh, because of course they were born in America um, they then, during some, some very formative years, when they were ages, you know, five to nine, four to eight, that's when they were in Ireland, which was a very interesting time for them to be there, to really engage with the experiences around them and to develop a sense of, of home. And now they're in Brazil doing the same thing. So it's almost like they've forgotten all about America and now Ireland is their home base and Brazil is their second country. And... Uh, it's a curious thing to see, well, it will be to see what happens next. What will they carry with them to their next country, to the next posting? Um, but uh, yeah, no, but something, it's something actually I came across when I worked at the World Bank because we had a lot of in international families there. And they had this phenomenon of the, the third culture, um, third culture children. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we were exposed to meeting meeting people who said oh my children they have a tough time adjusting and it's very difficult for them and they don't know what their identity is and i think whether it was conscious or subconscious um our decision to move to ireland was also i think grounded in in that sense of giving the children a sense of home
and uh, and I know it's still home for me, even though I'm now a, a nomad. Um, but uh, I think it's something we will try to promote with our children as well. It's almost like they have two homes, Ireland and Brazil, and then wherever wherever else they happen to be when, when they're when they're older. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a bit long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lara, in a very brief way, let me interrupt a little bit. In a brief, a very brief way, he has touched a few topics that we have have been reading. Emigration, because Ireland is more famous for emigration, considering the great famine that they were obliged to leave the country, and also and now immigration, you know. Okay, go ahead, Larry. And it's interesting because you said that you you were born in a little bit like a pure Ireland, like culturally pure, like Ireland. And now you have kids just like yours who arrive in Ireland, but they do have their previous identity, their previous culture, um, just like the rappers I, I research about. And it's a new kind of Irish person because they consider themselves Irish, even though they're immigrants, even though they were born in another country. So that's very interesting, really. Hmm. Yeah, and I think um, um, I could mention briefly when, you know, when we arrived in, in Ireland, my, my daughters were four and five. And so they had, they had American accents and... Uh, um they they had spent all their life in america apart from holidays and so but was amazing within i would say one month within one month because they were so young and they're like sponges they were already speaking in in irish accents um <laughs> they were already you know playing irish sports and and doing you know things that we would associate with being irish um but what's interesting too is um and we can touch on this later but when when I came back to Ireland to live in 2013, again, I saw how Ireland had changed massively with immigration, which was more economic immigration, you know, of other, of other, other nationalities. And the amazing thing to me was to see the school that I had been to when I was much younger. So it had been um, probably nearly 30 years earlier, 25 years earlier. Maybe there was one person from outside Ireland in the whole school. Um, but in the school that my daughters went to, it was it was in, in 2013, it was 40% non-Irish in the school, which to me was just amazing. There was Brazilians and Nigerians, a lot of Eastern Europeans, Polish, uh, Latvian, Lithuanian. So that for me was quite striking. And it was nice too, because my daughters associated school with uh, a, a, a multicultural setting, because in, in America, it had been a very multicultural setting as well. So going to going to this school in, in my hometown was, was almost normal for them to see children with different backgrounds and different color and different clothes. And, and that was exciting for me and exciting for them as well. That's awesome, really. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question here also regarding um, migration. There are some types, some reasons why um, people migrate. And as Professor Noelle has mentioned, um, there are some types of migration. Um, there are internal migration, external migration, emigration, return migration, seasonal migration. And I wanted to know which types of migration do you think you fit into? And which ones do you think are most common in Ireland? You have mentioned economic reasons why um, people go to Ireland. Are there others, other reasons? Hmm. Actually, I wonder if, if you could maybe clarify for me the difference between external migration and emigration. Um, I didn't so, understand the distinction. Mm -hmm. I believe external migration is more general every time somebody leaves a country. But um, emigration is when you are leaving your country and immigration is when you arrive somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know? So you emigrated from Ireland and you immigrated to Brazil. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think in in my experience of going to to live in America, I, I would consider that was 
um, you know, a type of emigration. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I, I would have appeared in the statistics of emigration for people leaving Ireland. Um, but, you know, like I mentioned to earlier, how, you know, maybe this counter cyclical uh, experience I've had when I was leaving Ireland, um, the numbers of the, the numbers of Irish people leaving was very low um, because because there were so many opportunities in Ireland. And uh, when I returned to Ireland seven years later, pretty much, um, it was the opposite. The numbers uh, returning back were very low and the numbers leaving were very high. So for me, it was very strange. And even just recently, I saw this graph which showed the migration paths over the last number of years. And I just saw myself as being almost the opposite to the to the the way uh, the trends were going. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of people who came to Ireland, I would say maybe the first real big wave of migration or, or uh, immigration into Ireland for non-Irish people uh, probably coincided with the the economic boom that we had, the so-called Cathy Tiger. And people were coming because they had good opportunities in Ireland. We had we had full employment in, a, in an economic sense. We had a um, huge amount of industry and business and opportunity. And in a way as well, the, as you know, Irish people went from being relatively poor in Europe to being one of the wealthiest countries in Europe. And suddenly people's, you know, people's consumption patterns changed. People wanted wanted nicer things, wanted more restaurants and, and coffee bars and uh, maybe a cleaner to clean your house once a week or something. And so suddenly this also created an opportunity for people to fill these jobs, to work in cafes and, and restaurants and, um, and maybe cleaning jobs. And, you know, in the case of a lot of Brazilians who came to Ireland, meat, meat factories as well. Uh, we had... Uh, we, interestingly, there's a, there's a town about uh, 20 minutes away from my hometown. So I'm from Galway on the west coast of Ireland. And there was a town called Gort. Gort is in the south of Galway. And it was probably the biggest concentration of Brazilians uh, at any time during the Celtic Tiger. I think at one point, something like 20% of the population of the town was, was Brazilian. And a lot of them came from uh, a city called Annapolis, which is here in, in near me in, 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 in Goiás. And they came to work in, in meat processing plants because they had the skills and they had the, the knowledge and interest to do that work. And it became a huge um, uh, exporting product for Ireland. We, we export 80 or 90 percent of our beef uh, to the UK, to Europe, even to America. And so, yeah, at the peak of the immigration into Ireland, there were 20% of the population were Brazilian. And they had their own carnival festival. They had uh, <laughs> Brazilians playing football on the team with the, with the Irish guys. And it was really interesting. They had a, a Brazilian shop there. You could buy coxinha and pau de queijo and this kind of thing, <laughs> which, was, which was very fun. Um, Unfortunately, when when our economic crash happened, you know, around 2008, 2009, a lot of these uh, opportunities for work disappeared. And so a lot of people who had come to Ireland um, to work and to seek opportunities maybe had to leave again. Of course, many, many mm -hmm. stayed as well. And so now we still have a huge legacy of people from from the main countries that came to Ireland that have now really integrated into Ireland, I think, very strongly. Um, but yeah, so I, I think the main driver for people coming to Ireland was was economic opportunity. Um, I think as well, Ireland was seen as a safe country. It was seen as um, mostly friendly people. Um, uh, maybe people certainly didn't come for the weather. I know that much. Uh, <laughs> Ireland can be a bit cold and wet um, and grey. Uh, but they, you know, in the case of this town I mentioned near my, my city called Gort, you know, some, some people came and found work and then suddenly they were telling their friends and their family and then more people came. And so, we, you know, we created pockets around the country where you had a lot of Brazilians here and maybe a lot of Nigerians here and a lot of Eastern Europeans over there. And uh, 
Yeah, truly, it was a it was a phenomenal time. Um, at the time, the immigration into Ireland was 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 so so strong. It was also the time that I was, you know, kind of in university and finishing university, and I used to do a lot of work, you know, in restaurants, in supermarkets, you know, more work associated with students, but also with the immigrants. So I used to work with a lot of different nationalities, and for me that was also very fascinating because of my, you know, my long-running interest in in other cultures, um, and so yeah, I think the, I think. Really, the main driver was economic opportunity, but then it became also about family. Um, once once somebody set up a community in Ireland, then they invited more people from their country, and that also grew um, grew the uh, immigration numbers. Um, yeah, uh, of course, for Irish people, Irish people, you know, we always say in Ireland one of our best uh, economic policies, sadly is that a lot of Irish people can leave when the, when, the, when the going is tough, when the economy is bad. So throughout our mm-hmm. history, whenever the economy dropped, Irish people left. And so that created a, a way for the economy to survive uh, because they no longer had to have so many people in employment. Um, so Irish people, of course, more or less follow that path. You know, during good times, people return home, more likely, and during bad times, people emigrate. And so, you know, the last few years, I think the numbers are, are, are coming back again, where more people are returning home because the economy has been doing well. What will happen now after the pandemic? That's another story. Um, because, you know, in a normal time, if there's an economic crisis, Irish people can leave and seek opportunity elsewhere. But during a pandemic, mm-hmm. when all countries are in trouble, yeah. That, that safety valve, that opportunity maybe isn't there. And so that's going to create some real challenges for, for all of our countries, but obviously for Ireland as well, which traditionally has been a, a country that, that manages emigration, you know, as nearly, as, oh, not manages, but uh, the culture allows for immigration very easily, maybe compared to some countries. Yes, yes. Very interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about Irish immigrants in Brazil? since Irish people actually leave their um, their home country to go elsewhere. Um, what about Irish immigrants in Brazil? What do you think are the most common um, reasons why they immigrate here? Uh, that's interesting. I, I, I would think maybe it, it has changed over time. I think, you know, back in the 1960s and 70s, a lot of Irish people came to Brazil who worked in, in missionary uh, work, religious missionary work. Um, my experience as well is that a lot of um, some of the Irish who came here a long time ago came to seek adventure as well. It was seen as a, a, a very far away country, maybe less, less so now, but certainly back then. Um, and it was a chance to really experience a whole different culture, um, different language, different food. And and then people loved being loved being here and, and settled here. And so we have many Irish so-called diaspora who've been here for decades. Oh, yeah. um, I think in, in, in the time that I have been in Brazil, I would say people have come here more or less for two reasons. We either have maybe more young professionals who have the opportunity to get very good work, maybe in Sao Paulo or in some of the bigger cities. Um, and it really, it's 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 like me going to America. It was it's by choice. It's not not necessarily by economic necessity, but it's because they have an opportunity to work for a big company here. Um, I think the other main driver, which is probably the the biggest one, is Irish Brazilian relationships. Um, as you know, I'm married to a Brazilian. Um, we have, in a normal year, uh, leaving aside pandemics, we have. 16,000 Brazilians coming to Ireland to learn English. And we have mm-hmm. hundreds more coming to study third level education. And so we have a lot of Brazilians living in Ireland, a lot of Brazilians and Irish getting together, creating families. And so it's, it's been fascinating to me during this pandemic when we had a lot, of, a lot of extra consular work in the embassy, people trying to travel, people trying to go to Ireland, people trying to come to Brazil. It was really fascinating to me just how many Brazilian Irish couples there are, um, and uh, you know, I would say that's been the biggest driver in the last number of years. 
um, Irish Brazilian mm-hmm. couples. I've never come up with a good term for that. I don't know if they're called Irazilian or Braz Irish or something. <laughs> uh, we can we can work on that one. But I, I find a lot of uh, Brazilian Irish couples they either come to Brazil to to maybe experience the country here or to raise their children here around family, or 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 the opposite to do it in Ireland where there is maybe a family support and maybe uh, mm-hmm. a, a job opportunity as well. So to me, they're the main drivers for for why Irish people have come to Brazil. Um, and you mentioned as well that being outside Ireland has changed your way to see your own home country. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, um, it's something I'm I'm still kind of reflecting on. I think I'm I'm learning all the time about how I how I view my own country. You know, as I said mm-hmm. earlier, it it was a country I, I loved growing up and I had wonderful experiences there. And yet I felt like I wanted to see the world. I wanted to leave and I chose to leave to to maybe explore myself and my my views on the world in, in another country. Um, and so moving back to Ireland after being in in, um, in America for seven years was almost traumatic for me in the beginning. Um, I had left a single guy, you know, just taking on any adventure I could. And I returned with a wife and two children and responsibilities. And uh, I had just given up a a very good job. And so I had an economic consideration that I had to factor in as well. And so when I returned to Ireland, I also noticed the country had changed so much in in the seven years I had been away. I think the time I left Ireland, the it was still, you know, the peak of the Celtic Tiger. There was a lot of consumption, a lot of construction. Uh, people were buying cars, building houses. People were really taking out a lot of credit, you know, from the bank just to buy stuff. It was, it was all about, okay, for many, many years, we've had very little money. And now we have money, we're going to party and we're going to... <laughs> spend our money and we're going to go on big holidays and so when i came back to ireland um i guess while i had while while i had lived in america i had been visiting ireland every year in the summertime just to to visit my family and i was struck by just how much construction my my hometown used to have maybe three thousand people and over over a period of about five or eight years they built hundreds and hundreds of new houses new housing estates and so the whole feel of my my village it was no longer a village it was actually a suburb of <laughs> of the city of Galway and so by the time I came back to Ireland to live in in, in 2013 it was just after the economic crash uh, a few a few years after and so you could see the the after effects of this economic crash um, a lot more unemployment suddenly you would see these, they're called ghost estates. So housing estates where they had been under construction and suddenly the money stopped and they just stopped building. So empty, empty, empty houses, houses that weren't finished. They they didn't have doors, they didn't have windows. Um, My own sister bought a house in around 2010 or something. And when I visited her house in 2013, when I moved there, there was a whole block of apartments across the street from her house, it, empty, it wasn't finished, no, no windows, no doors, no electrical systems, just a huge empty shell of an apartment block. And so these became known as ghost estates. They were just abandoned. Um, and these were common all around the country where people kept thinking this, this economic boom was going to last forever. And let's just build, let's just build, let's make more money. And so... That to me was a very visible like scar on the on the on the on the locality when I went when I went back. Um, and thankfully, a lot of that has changed now. They have either taken away some of these shells, these ghost houses, or they've actually invested money to to finish the buildings. But that process took many many years, and uh, I think even now they're still recovering uh, some of the damage from from that economic crash. Um, maybe another thing that was quite striking, which, which I mentioned earlier at, in, in relation to my daughter's school, 
was the the demographic change how suddenly 40 percent of my daughter's school was actually now non-irish um and that to me was was fascinating just the the different languages you hear on the street the different sounds there were new new shops that had opened up um in my town a polish shop where you could buy polish goods um, a brazilian shop um you they had a nigerian restaurant uh, and these were unheard of when i was growing up and so i i you know for me i guess i'm a diplomat it's something i i adore other cultures um other other learning from other nationalities and so for me this is a very very positive thing i saw suddenly ireland you know while retaining what makes ireland ireland its culture its music its sport its food it was also embracing all these other cultures and uh and i think largely to the to the you know to the most significant extent welcoming all these other nationalities into the country i mean i do think nowadays we're hearing more stories of some some problems with immigrants and racism and this kind of thing which i think unfortunately is 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 evident in in almost every society around the world and irish society is not immune to that unfortunately um i think in general irish society has been very tolerant and very welcoming and i think it's it's been fascinating to to me over the last few years almost uh learning a bit more about my culture through seeing the experiences of other <coughs> nationalities so seeing seeing people who suddenly look very different playing irish sports and being very successful playing irish sports such as gaelic football or hurling um playing irish music um and you see them even nowadays on tiktok and on twitter you see these amazing performers who don't do not look you know stereotypically irish and um, doing amazing things with with what are you know important parts of irish culture and i think that that kind of marriage of different cultures and experiences is uh is really fascinating and i think maybe ireland was a bit late to that late to that party compared to other countries um but i think mostly it's been a it's been a very good thing for for my country and i think that's something i i enjoyed most about coming home and seeing that my children could see this diversity that they saw in other places that's amazing really because this is exactly what um globalization is about right mm -hmm. this dialogue between cultures and um this is culturality actually so i have a question on that <laughs> which is as a deputy head of mission you have taken part in initiatives of the of the embassy of ireland in brazil to promote cultural interchanges um there is also the program imaginada de portas abertas right in which you met public school students to talk about Irish culture. And then um, you visited, you have visited um, their schools to learn a little bit about Brazilian culture. Would you talk a little bit about this experience, please? Oh, wow, you found a, you found a picture of me on, on Twitter. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, yes, this was a, a lovely experience for me. Um, Uh, this was an, an initiative Embaixada de Portas Abertas, which was organized by the the the, the EFI government here in, in, in Brasilia. Um, but actually, even long before I heard of this initiative, I, I had been welcoming um, young young students groups into the embassy to to learn about Ireland, and I have a, a standard presentation that I can deliver where I explain, explain to them about Irish culture, Irish music, Irish food, Irish sports. Um, we talk about stereotypes about Irish people and, and we try to ex explore a little dialogue around uh, Brazil as well. And, and then finally opportunities for, these, for Brazilians to come to Ireland, whether it's to study, uh, to learn English, um, to, 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 to enjoy tourism. Um, and so that's something I've always enjoyed as part of my, my job. And so then this, this Embaixada de Portas Abertas came along, which other embassies in Brasilia had already taken part in. And the idea is really this, it's this cultural exchange um, where, you know, the, the local government has some guidelines around, around how you should do it. But it's, 
you know, they, they, they assign you a, a public school in the area, in the greater Brasilia area. And they come to your embassy and we need to, we, we, we put on a, a kind of a, a, a presentation for them. We made them some Irish food that they could enjoy. We show them, you know, some examples of Irish sport and uh, really just to show a lot of these kids, you know, who are from a, a, a relatively poor background in the public school in Brasilia, who wouldn't have the opportunity to travel, who wouldn't necessarily hear much about Ireland on the TV or in the Brazilian media. And so this was a really fascinating experience for them to, to learn about another culture, to learn how other people, um, how other people live their lives. Um, one interesting question I got from a, a Brazilian uh, child was, um, you know, asking, is it true that you have your washing machines, you know, for washing clothes in your kitchen? And I thought that was just fascinating how somehow they had heard about this, but how it's such a common thing in Ireland that you have, you have your washing machine in your dryer, which is maybe in the kitchen or just beside the kitchen. Um, whereas in Brazil, you have the Aria G Servicio, which is, to me, such an obvious thing. You have a separate area where you can do everything, uh, where you can leave dirty things. Um, but in Ireland, it's very common to have it in the kitchen, which uh, I, I thought that was so funny that this child had picked up on this, um, <laughs> this little difference between our, our countries. And then um, the return part of this exchange was for uh, me and colleagues of mine in the embassy. We went to this public school in uh, uh, Sobrejinho in, in Brasilia area. And uh, it was just amazing. They, they put on a whole performance for us with Brazilian dance. And we had a, a discussion again about Brazilian culture and Irish culture. And they shared the most amazing food with us that they had prepared for us. And uh, it was just a, a wonderful experience to see how welcoming they were, how excited they were to see um, people from another country and to learn about a country that they would not normally have any reason to, to learn about. And uh, yeah, for me, that was very rich just to, to exchange. Here's what I, what kind of sport I play. Here's what kind of sport they play, the kind of music they like, the kind of food they like, the kind of food I like. And um, I think that's one of the richest experiences of being a, a diplomat in a foreign country. It's, it's that chance to to promote your culture in the country, but also to learn about the culture that you are you are living in. Um, in. In just in terms of a maybe, I suppose a lot of our work in the embassy in, in culture is to promote Irish culture, and that's where we've been so lucky having partners and friends around Brazil, like the Association for Research in Irish Studies and others around Brazil, where we've done you know, collaborative work on things like Bloomsday to celebrate James Joyce's work. Um, I know we've we've had a big event here in Brasilia each year, unfortunately not this year because of the pandemic, but we've had an event in Brasilia, which is probably our biggest cultural event of the year in uh, in a bookshop in Brasilia called Zabinho. <laughs> um, we have Irish music and we have dancing and we have Irish food. And we also have a, maybe a Brazilian academic coming to talk about um, an interpretation of James Joyce's work um, mm -hmm. through Portuguese. And it's, it's fascinating as well to see um, how even the, the, the translation of a work of, of you know, Irish literature into Portuguese, it raises so many issues around what does that mean and the context. And hearing about the process of doing the translation was fascinating for me to see the work in a different way as well because you're seeing the thinking behind how do you translate this concept and it helps me to understand more how how the the book was originally written and so for me that was a fascinating thing where you know here i was as an irish person learning or, or relearning about irish literature through uh, a Brazilian interpretation of language and expressions and context. Mm -hmm. And so we're obviously very grateful here at the embassy to have great partners like uh, Professor Noelia and others around the, around the country. And um, we've also had great experiences working with Brazilian musicians who have taken on Irish music. Um, just to name one, someone like Alex Navarre, who's a uh, he plays Ilan pipes. Ilan pipes are a little bit like 
bagpipes, but Elin is the Irish word for elbow. Uh, so instead of using, you know, instead of blowing the pipes, you use your elbow to, to pump the air and to create the music. And so Alex has just become this like legendary Elin pipe player uh, mm -hmm. who spent time in Ireland and now spends, you know, tours around Brazil and, and creates the most amazing Irish music. And so for me as well, that's fascinating, that exchange where you have a, a Brazilian who's gone to Ireland, who has adopted the local culture, the local music, suddenly is playing it better than any Irish person maybe, and then bringing it back to Brazil. And I think that's, uh, that's fascinating as well um, to, to see that. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's, that continues to be a great uh, activity for us here at the embassy. And we're, we're very grateful to have partners such as yourselves to work with us on these issues. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Professor Noel, do you have any, any questions, any, any comments? Uh, no, I, I'll finish after the, the questions that Sanyu, I think Sanyu has a question. I'm not sure. Uh, um, now we will be displaying then um, some of the viewers' questions. Sanyu? Mm -hmm. Ireland has been through an economic period of great development that is known as Celtic Tiger, as we were discussing. Um, what are some of the changes you have seen in Ireland pre and post Celtic Tiger? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I touched on some of the points earlier. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest ones for me would be um, around the, de the demographics, um, how the, the society has become so much more multicultural. That is a huge change uh, from my perspective. Um, wealth, I think Ireland has certainly become a lot wealthier over, over that period. Um, there was a, obviously a huge um, financial impact by the, the economic crash, but, um, but still a lot of people are suddenly driving, you know, nicer cars and living in bigger houses. Um, now, unfortunately, there's also been probably an increase in inequality as well. And so people who maybe had made good money before were able to continue making money, whereas people who maybe were on the edges of society or maybe not in a very big job, um, maybe struggled more, I would say, during the financial crisis. Um, obviously, there's been social change as well. I think, you know, I don't know if you can... Um, I think to some extent during the during the Celtic Tiger years, I think Irish people probably became more confident in a way. I think for maybe decades, even hundreds of years, especially as a as a country that was you know controlled by a colonial power, I think in some ways we were mm -hmm. we were a bit sub subservient. We we maybe weren't ambitious enough. We were happy with you know. The status quo so to speak and i think when we had this economic success it showed us that we could we could be successful in the world we could achieve more we could be more ambitious and i think that attitude was quite striking for my generation as well and 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 subsequent subsequent generations um and i think that that confidence carries through now as well where we're probably a little bit more ambitious for for our country and for what we should and could achieve um, again, these are just my own personal ex uh, experiences and my own kind of opinion on it. Um, you know, again, whether I can't attribute a cause and a cause and effect, but during that time as well, the the Catholic Church maybe lost some of its influence in Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. More and more news came out around some scandals around abuse. Um, and uh, I think the, the influence of the church, probably because of that, and also because people suddenly became more interested in, in, in wealth and money, um, I think that also contributes to the, the weakening of the influence of the church. And alongside that as well, this embrace of other cultures, of other societies, of the world in general, I think we became a more liberal society as well, where we... We became the first country to uh, vote marriage, uh, equal marriage um, referendum, where uh, I think we were the first country in the world to to vote in a national referendum on equal rights for, for marriage, uh, for um, 
you know, gay, lesbian, uh, the whole works. And uh, also a really big vote in, in, in Ireland in 2018, which was to allow for abortion, which was something that was unheard of in, in years earlier. So I think that's kind of come in, in tandem with the Celtic Tiger. Um, uh, let me see. Um, yeah, I think for me, they're the big ones. Um, I think just mostly visibly for me, it's it's just the fact that our society is so much more diverse. You can now walk down the street in Dublin and you're, you're hearing Portuguese, you're hearing French, you're hearing, um, you know, different languages from the Middle East, <laughs> Arabic and... Uh, um and just a lot more color a lot more life i think which i think is very interesting awesome do you have any other questions maybe we have time for one more uh nobody no questions so far because if nobody is going to make questions i'll finish with saying something i just wonder as well if if um I'd just like to hear very briefly from, from Lara about her experience working with the, or, or learning more about Irish rap. Uh, and oh, yes. When, when I say Irish rap, it's, it's rap created by newly immigrant Irish people mm -hmm. uh, who are probably originally from a different country. And I think that's something fascinating to learn about my country through your perspectives as well. Oh, yes. It's amazing. Actually, I love rap music. I used to listen to American rappers, um, British rappers even, but I haven't heard before of Irish rap. And um, people outside Ireland used to, used to say, oh, there is no such thing as rap in Ireland and stuff. But since the Celtic Tiger, the number of immigrants there, it's like skyrocketed. It has skyrocketed. And um, lots of these immigrants arrived in, in Ireland very early, in a very early age. The, the group I study is called Rosangano Family. And there is, um, I don't remember the exact country, but there are two musicians, two rappers from Africa, from countries in Africa. And there is one Irish man in, from Limerick, I guess. And they rap about their experience in Ireland, thinking, well, I am an Irish person. I, I went to school in, I've gone to school in Ireland. I, I live here. I eat Irish food. But I'm also from my previous um, country. I also have, have this part of my identity. And they talk exactly about being recognized as Irish, as Irish people but also um, not this pure Irish idea of being, um, like you said, when you were um, born. Yeah. It's very interesting. There are a few songs in which they criticize um, our society for maybe not being so welcome to them. Um, they talk about Irish issues, Irish politics. They talk about also their own culture, their the cultures, the culture of the countries they are from, and um, all of this. So it's quite rich and it's quite amazing. Mm, actually, when I when I heard you were interested in this topic, I I, I had to go on YouTube to see some of the the videos. Oh. Uh, you, it's Rosan Gal. No, how do you say the name? Rosan family. Rosan family. Rosan yes. family. And I saw this wonderful video where I think they made it in in the part of Ireland called the Burren. So it's. It's a very rocky surface, and it's it's quite a unique. Oh, it's um, so cool! It's quite a unique landscape. The sound, the sound. To, yes, quite a unique landscape, I think, to Ireland. It's almost like a, a moon landscape, and it was lovely, to, lovely to see them embracing that really beautiful Irish landscape. In some cases, they were wearing Irish, you know, football shirts and yes. different things, and uh, and yet talking about their experiences through rap, which I think was great. So I'm. I'm I'm now I'm now interested to explore more. I think I'm going to have to go on a, a YouTube a YouTube uh, uh, binge someday. <laughs> this one is one of my favorite songs by Irish, Irish rappers because the the music video is really interesting. There is a scene in which they interpret this idea of "Make America Great Again," "Make America Great Again" by Trump, 
but they say make Ireland great again. And if you think about great, you can think about great famine because they are eating when they when they have this hat on. It's it's amazing. Actually, one thing I saw, just to mention, I think the hat, one of the hats I saw had make Ireland grand again. Grand again, yes. And so grand, grand, grand in a, you know, you know, I think the Irish have a certain uh, use for the word grand. It's like, yeah. ah, everything's grand, everything's fine, <laughs> as, as opposed to the dictionary term. And so I think that was a clever, a clever kind of a, a joke as well. Mm-hmm. Which I think it's, it's a joke on ourselves, you know. Um, you know, it's it's not this seriousness of make America great again. It's more like, ah, let's just have fun and let's be Irish. So I think that's nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's quite interesting. This group is amazing. Okay. So, we reach to the end of our conversation this afternoon. I believe everybody is very happy. It was really a very rich discussion. And uh, the... The video is going to, to stay, uh, to be kept in the YouTube. Am I right, Lara? Yes, yes. So yes. later on, to hear. we can hear again because it's a lesson. I think uh, Declan could touch many, many topics, many important t- topics. And uh, the theme of our conversation, of our chats, has been social transformation, migration, and he really discussed about the social, economic, political, uh, demographic, everything. So you have covered Mm -hmm. everything that interests us most. So thank you, Declan. It Great. was thank really you. a success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, and I hope uh, you could understand me. Yes, and, uh, you are the right person. Um, <laughs> it's it's nice to get the the personal personal experiences. I think so. Um, mm-hmm. I don't claim to be an expert on these issues, but certainly I, I try to explain it from my own perspective. Oh, yes, and so thank you for the opportunity. Mm-hmm. From your perspective, uh, you really enriched your conversation. Mm-hmm. You really touch the right point the, the point Great. that we expected you to to reach <laughs> Great. well thank, thank you, you. And I, I wish you i wish you success with the rest of the series and uh, mm-hmm. i will watch I'll be, i will be watching next time uh, uh-huh. and i look forward to it i'm trying i'm trying to get in touch with alan gilsonan because he's the next one to mm. see if he he can come and discuss about his last uh, production, I think his film meeting, I'm not sure if he can mm-hmm. come because he's uh, very busy. But mm-hmm. later we have another one that is our uh, Brazilian friend, uh, Elise. She's mm-hmm. going to talk about her experience in Ireland. So okay. let's see who comes Great. next. Thank you. Thank you and good luck with the initiative. Well, well, okay. well done. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope Mr. Sean can come when when he's back from Ireland. <laughs> I'm sure he I'm sure he'll be happy to 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 be involved. Yes. Tell him that as soon as he comes, we'll be in touch to see if he can also share his experiences with us. I'm pretty yeah, I'm pretty sure his experience will be very different to mine. So <laughs> Yes. Yes, because he has lived in many places. Many, many places. Many more yeah. places than you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you, Mr. Okay, Dachlan. Take care. Thank you, Pat. Bye bye. See you soon. Ciao, ciao. Obrigado, ciao, ciao. Obrigada, obrigada. Obrigada, Lara. Ooh.